Sarah, it's good to see you again. And uh, thank you for incorporating CMOC into your design competition. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about the design competition? How many teams? What are the goals? And, and how did CMOC play a part uh, in that competition? I think you have given us a very uh, revolutionary solution to how to start a design that is very dependent on you know, accurate data uh, so that we're able to start from an initial correct uh, platform of concept. So this year, Mars City Design uh, competition is focusing on creating an urban farming. That means that, you know, we're imagining living on Mars already. Uh, and we are thinking about feeding nine people, uh, meaning three crews of three people. And mm -hmm. the idea is, of course, to understand from this module, we can multiply and apply it to urban design scale. So, you know, from um, the point of view of uh, the experience that you guys already have, uh, I think it's important to connect, you know, the reality, but also being open to uh, what could be uh, different in terms of results of design. Okay. So. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks again for, for incorporating CMOC into your program and excited to see the outcome. So what I thought we'd do today is um, I'll share my screen. Okay, so we're at, uh, we're at CMOC uh, sign in. I'm going to sign in under my account. And instead of doing a new configuration, which puts me back on the server and allows me to, to build my own design, I'm instead going to load existing simulation data. And I'm going to load this, the first one from the eight uh, submissions we got from the different teams. So I'm going to go ahead and open that. And as you can see, this is the cool thing, is that the, the data is already loaded from beginning to end. You don't have to wait for the simulation to finish. It's already done. And yeah. so the first thing I always do um, when, I, when I look at a data set or when I've even designed my own is I just kind of run through it. I grab the slider and I just run through it beginning to end. First thing I do is, did the humans make it? Okay, they made it. If they turn red, they're dead. That's bad. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look at the mission configuration. So I'm going to choose mission configuration. And this tells me that it was a 100-day mission, four inhabitants, uh, 1,200 uh, kilograms of food, which is plenty of food. Uh, there's a large crew quarters, so they have lots of room, uh, lots of room for themselves, lots of private room, and uh, a medium-sized greenhouse, 500 solar panels, 2,000 uh, kilowatt-hour batteries, and two Eclipse modules. So that's our, that's our basic setup. And then I'm going to... Um, actually, I'm going to change this one. I'm, I'm going to change this one to uh, greenhouse configuration just quickly. And I can, you can see that there was a large greenhouse chosen, but very little that was actually used. So it could have been a small greenhouse given the quantity of plants. The benefit to this is you have a lot of air as a buffer. So if anything goes wrong, if, you, if your CO2 is running high, your oxygen is running low, you have a little bit of extra time uh, because of that. Uh, that, that's really, really interesting. And uh, so if we, see this, if we see it that way, how do we uh, adjust in terms of what is the, the perfect balance for space in a greenhouse versus the content of the crops? Well, the, the, no, that's a good question because it takes us back to one of the fundamental concepts of CMOC and more importantly, one of the fundamental concepts of design designing any kind of biosphere, right? So we look at biosphere two, the, the, the experiment that was run um, just, a, just an hour from where I live um, here in Arizona. That experiment taught us something is that even three and a half acres of sealed habitat was not enough of a buffer or did not present enough of a buffer to mitigate some of the the challenging circumstances that those eight inhabitants endured. So within a matter of hours, they were seeing fluctuations of CO2 and oxygen um, in a huge facility. You would think that something that large would have a much longer buffer, and, and it, it didn't. So you look at the Earth as a whole, and you think, my God, it's an entire planet. But we know that the buffer of the entire planet is also limited. It's not unlimited. And that when we make changes to 
um, the you know, industrial revolutions and technological revolutions and our, and our use of, of fossil fuels and the CO2 that we're giving off, eventually we run out of a buffer, meaning there's no more room for error. So small, medium, large greenhouse, small, medium, large crew quarters, yes, it makes a difference. If you have one person living in a small, green, a small crew quarters and no greenhouse, they're going to run out of oxygen much faster than one person living in a large crew quarters and a large greenhouse. They may have an extra couple of days um, of, of air to breathe. But that's not the long-term solution, right? That, does, that doesn't save them over the course of years. It saves them over the course of, of a few hours or a few days. So it can help, but it's not, a, it's not a key factor in whether or not we're going to make this mission serve, you know, run properly for years at a time. And so we don't really want to use that as a major instrument. We'd rather get all the other things right. And if we have the opportunity to do a larger space, well, it gives us a few hours here and there of extra, of extra room. And then we'll check again, right? Is that how we use this? Uh, well, well, you'd have to go back and build a new mission. We don't, you don't have the ability to change it because you've already built your mission and set it in motion. So there's no way to modify it afterwards. Okay. But when you design your next mission, then you would design, you would change the parameters. And that's the whole point of a scientific process that's is awesome. that you have a hypothesis, you yeah. build build your experiment, you run your experiment, and you compare the outcome to your original hypothesis. You then modify the hypothesis, run the experiment again, and compare the outcome, and you modify it, and you run, and you experiment. You do it over and over and over again, and you either see what you anticipated, or you, you learn from the, from the outcome and realize that your hypothesis was wrong, and that your, your um, experiment taught you something that, you were, that was unexpected, which is often the case. So in that respect, uh, we, we really treat CINOC as a scientific tool for exploring the parameter space um, of living on, you know, in this isolated ecosystem. The first thing I notice is that when we, when we launch into the first run, we see that you chose plenty of solar panels. I, I, I intuitively know this because I've run it so many times. You chose plenty of solar panels. There's nothing wrong with that. And your batteries, so the first thing I check is look at your, the energy in your batteries. So we have 1,000 and 1,000. Uh, we started just about 1,000, and we don't want that to ever go down, 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 down. So you can see that throughout your entire run, you're staying at just about the same level. You're always in the high 800s, low 900s, uh, which is good. Over time, it looks like, nope, nope, it stays high. So you have plenty of solar panels, so good job on that. Um, you maybe could have gone a few lower, but I think we're okay. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at your water. And let's look at your potable water. So you have 3,000 kilograms of potable water. What happens to that over time? It goes up and then it goes down and it goes down gradually. And that's actually expected. Partially that's because of uh, the loss of the, uh, the urine. Uh, we're unable to process urine fully. And you can, see, um, you can see the salts building up right here, the unused salts. And that's essentially where the water is being lost, is that we can only process human urine 98% effectively based upon Paragon Space Development Corporation's most advanced systems. So that means that every cycle of urine to potable water, urine to potable water, we're losing about 2% of that. Um, the next version of CMOC will have the ability to bring water in from the outside as an, as an ISRU. Uh, in situ resource utilization. Your food, um, let's also check food. This is just kind of a parameter check. So we start off with 1,200 and you're down to 700. So you brought plenty of food, more than you needed, and that's good. Okay, so now when we run through again, next, so first thing I noticed, plenty of power. Here's your consumption. And I noticed that you have two Eclipse racks, which means that when those things turn on, they are really turning on. Um, they're consuming a lot of power, which is fine. You've got plenty. And they're drawing the CO2 down very effectively. So let's go in here just for a moment and look at consumption breakdown. And you'll find that, remember, this is our, our now line right here on the right-hand side of this panel is where we are now in time. So let's look over here to the CO2 removal, and we're going to step forward one at a time. There we go. So the CO2 removal um, SAWD, the SAUD, turned on. It's active, and it's going to stay active until this line drops, and now it turned off. So we know now that this power spike, or this CO2 consumption, and this power spike here, you can see they're correlated. That is the CO2 removal agent kicking on to bring the CO2 down. So that explains that. Now what this is cool is that, see how the, this bar here is getting lower and narrower. 
So it gets lower and narrower and lower and narrower. Why? Because the plants are growing. So now we come back to plant growth and we can see that we've got some very mature plants. We've got onions and red beets. In fact, spinach just got replanted. So spinach has already gone through a full cycle from zero to 100% right there. And then it was harvested and we replanted the spinach already. So as those plants mature, our need for the CO2 removal agent is reduced. Now look at this, see this curve, this underlying curve, that's not an accident, that's the actual daily growth cycle and the CO2 sequestration conducted by the plants, the respiration of the plants. So watch this, now the CO2 reduction agent is only turning on just momentarily, just turning on for one hour and that's it. And then off again and eventually done. We no longer need any more of the CO2 uh, sequestration agent. So if we go back to this, you'll now find that it's not turning on at all. Now we have the urine process and other things, but the CO2 agent is done. Why? Because the plants are doing all the work of, of removing the CO2 from the urine. Um, yep. So now we're gonna go back to here. Now, so we go through this and you can see this pattern, this cycle. That's the daily growth cycle of the plants. And when they're activated by what's called PAR, photosynthetic activated radiation, which is the light that the plants use to grow, when they're activated, they have a peak uh, time of day where they're drawing down the most amount of CO2. Now, what happened here? Something crashed, right? What is going on? So there's all this chaotic behavior. Okay, now I know from my prior experience with CMOC what's going on. I thought when I first saw this uh, earlier this year when we got CMOC running at this level, I thought this was a mistake. So I spent several afternoons building spreadsheets to match this dynamical model and realized that this is the plants. Drawing in CO2, not drawing in CO2, drawing in CO2, not drawing in CO2. Now, in the real world, I have to be, I have to be careful. The plants don't actually turn on and off like the light switch. That's not how they work. But in this current version of Steamock, the plant, in some respects, it's a digital version of a plant. And we want, to, we want to mitigate this in the future. We're still working on the best way of doing that at the software level. I should say the modeling level. But essentially what's happening is that if you look at the CO2 level over here, it's very, very low. Look how low it is. It's 0.0008%. There's almost no CO2 in the atmosphere, whereas it used to be at the 0.1. It was much higher, right? So what's happened, and this is, by the way, the activation point. So at 0.1% is when the CO2 scrubbers kick in. For human health reasons, we don't want it to go above that. So what's happening is that the plants are now mature and they're drawing it down. So watch the CO2. It goes down, down, down. And at this point, the CO2 is so low that the plants are basically starving each other or asphyxiating each other. The plants are mature, as you can see, one, two, three, four of them are almost ready to harvest. So you literally don't have enough humans. The issue right now is you don't have enough humans to breathe out enough CO2 to give the plants enough CO2 to grow. So the plant growth cycle is being stagnated. Now they're not dead, but they're not doing well. They're not happy. Now watch what happens, it's gonna recover. Now why does it recover? We'll look up here, one, two, three. We only have two plants that are ready or coming close to harvest. The other ones have been harvested, which means now they're no longer pulling down the CO2. So the good news is we still don't need, well, we didn't. So right here, we're still plants. And watch what happens here. Look at that. Now our CO2 agent kicked back in, the mechanical system kicked back in, and that's because the CO2 built back up. It's back up to 0.1%. Again, because of the mixture of plants that we have available, we only have one plant sitting at 98%. The other ones are all harvested. So right now, there's not enough plants to draw the CO2 down, and machines have to kick back in again. And you can see the cycle starts over. Now these are getting shorter and they're getting narrower, and we're starting to see the same bell curve function in the data point here. So that's the fun thing about CMOC. It's, it's amazingly complex. So this is a document that I've maintained for three years, and it's a very rich, dynamic document that has all the data used to build CMOC. This is available for free on the website. And so I'm going down to agriculture, and then we'll go down to the plant agents and the table of growth. And this is data from NASA, from a gentleman named Raymond Wheeler, who is um, a world-leading uh, expert on these uh, plant physiology and closed ecosystems. 
And so he's given us all the data about spinach. So he's given us how much light it needs, um, its growth period, how many, how many hours of light, 16 hours of light per day, its growth period is 30 days. This is on average how many grams per hour. When it's harvested per square meter, we get 219 grams per square meter and edible. Spinach is a very high, almost the entire plant is edible. So 197 of 219 grams of spinach are edible, which makes it a really good plant because you're not wasting that much material. So I started with that and said, okay, let's do spinach because it grows fast. And if you notice here, watch this, we go from zero to 100. That's one spinach cycle, right? We've planted, harvested, we've planted again. Two, we just harvested again. Three, we just harvested again. So this team did a really good job of choosing a life, a life, uh, a mission duration 100, in 100 days, we get three full harvests of spinach, which gives us a really nice data point. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to where the spinach is harvested the first time. So I'm gonna go back to where it's about 100%. And again, I've already done this. That's a time step 718. So if you look down here, I'm gonna just go forward step by step by step to 718. Now, what happens at 718? We're at 100%, we're ready to harvest. And if you look over here at edible biomass, okay? This is biomass total, edible and inedible, which means the leaves, the stalks, the roots, even the stuff we don't eat. And we're at 44.65 kilograms total which is all the plants in the garden combined. Now, we're gonna go one more time step. It goes down, right? Why does it go down? 44 kilograms down to 40 kilograms, and look what happens to the food. The food goes from 100 or 1,019 kilograms up to 1,022. Why? Because we harvested the biomass, the spinach from the garden and put it into our kitchen. So we literally moved the biomass, the edible portion from here to here. We go to time step 718, which is down here, and we take the mass before harvest, okay? And that's this, this one right here. And then we take the mass after harvest. So we go one step forward and we copy it there. That's a difference if we run it on our calculator, that's a difference of 3.77 kilograms edible biomass. How do I know it's edible? Because I go back here and confirm that in fact, uh, it is exactly uh, this amount or that's what it should be, is 197 grams per square meter. So now we go back to the mission. I'm really enjoying this, by the way. It's amazing. Okay, good, good. We now take, we know that the edible biomass that was harvested and moved from our total biomass into food was, uh, this make 3.77 kilograms, which is 3,776 3, grams. We also know from Ray Wheeler's work that the spinach, should be 197 one grams of edible biomass per square meter. So 197.1 times 20 times 20 should be 3,942 3, grams anticipated edible biomass at harvest. That's what we should see. But instead, we're only seeing 3,776 grams, which means we're missing 166 grams. So our plant did not produce the spinach plants did not produce their maximum potential yield. Something's missing. So what kept that spinach from producing its full biomass at harvest? That's where the scientific, you know, the, the research comes in and diving into this and understanding what happened. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So then I took the second harvest. So again, we're watching this number here. I took the second harvest cycle and I did the exact same thing. I recorded the time step. I looked at the kilogram mass, edible biomass before and after. There's a difference of 3,861 grams, which is a smaller difference than the previous time. And it turns out that there's 81 grams difference. And in the third harvest, there's 20 grams difference. Now, I admit that I thought maybe something was wrong with SEMA because that doesn't make sense because the chaotic behavior of the plants not getting enough CO2 is actually after it's it's in the third run it's not in the first or the second run you would think it would be the opposite you would think that the plants would be doing really well up here because they're not competing with each other and that at the end they would be doing very poorly because they're all competing for the for the, uh, for the carbon dioxide then it occurred to me when the eclis rack is running it's pulling the essential carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere 
and taking away from what the plants need in the greenhouse. And so the plant, the, at least in this case of the spinach, the spinach actually did better in its third harvest than it did in its first two harvests. And you can see we only lost 20 grams difference, which is really good. It's only one gram per square meter. Okay, that was a mouthful. That's amazing. <laughs> wow, so, uh, so yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 um, um, I would like to go back with the fact that uh, we did put two uh, life support systems. Uh, does it mean that if we just put one, uh, mm -hmm. well, I'll, I'll try that. Um, well, let, let's do that. So it just, it just happens. I, now, do you have any other questions about this before I log out and switch? No, to it's, it's, wow. I open okay. it. Okay. So now I'm going to choose four humans plus garden. It's the same configuration of yours, but different plants and only one eclis rack. So you can see the eclis rack is running, 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 just trying to keep up. It's really pushing the threshold uh, of what, of what the eclis rack can do. Now the eclis rack turns off, on, off, on, and it gets smaller and smaller spikes until we are relying just on the plants, just like in your model. So this is kind of a, a much more, it's a much more complex uh, configuration in that there's more interplay between the machines and the plants. But in the end, you don't get nearly as much chaotic behavior. We only have a very limited period of time, about two days in which plants are actually competing for CO2. Otherwise, it's a little more balanced. So are we saying that uh, we can actually expect to um, use less of the additional, uh, you know, like uh, transport systems uh, when the plant, as the plant grow? Well, no, it's a good question. So in the real world, if we were actually building a Martian or a lunar base, you would, of course, want to make absolutely certain that the humans are safe no matter what, right? So you would want to have a redundant system. So you'd want to have extra backup, extra life support systems, mechanical systems, in case the garden fails. What if we have crop, total crop failure? Either there's a leak in the greenhouse or there's a microbe that gets in the soil and kills the roots of all the plants, uh, whatever it is, we want to have a backup. So your design is actually a safer design in that you've got two life support systems. So they're going to be running, you could see at the beginning of this simulation that that, that single life support system was running nonstop just to keep up. That's not safe. That's, that's pushing the boundaries of that machine. If that machine broke for even a couple of hours, those humans' lives would be in danger. So your design was a better design from that standpoint. But the design that we have here is more of a hybrid solution in which you've got an interplay between the machines and the plants. And it, it, it demonstrates the careful balance between the two, not necessarily the ideal mission. So can we say that the solution is to actually bring in already grow, grown plants for the first cycle? Well, okay, if, yes, you could say that, but that's very difficult. There's a lot of reasons why you don't want to do that. Transporting green or uh, mature plants from Earth to Mars is incredibly difficult. Uh, plant, especially if you've grown the plants in gra a gravitational field, then you move into a no gravity, you know, to microgravity, gravity, um, it, it's not going to work. And, and, and all the experiments that have been done ever since the 1970s, um, the, uh, the, the Russian um, cosmonauts, they did a lot of experiments with, with plants. The uh, International Space Station has been a lot of experiments with plants. Water behaves really weird in microgravity. It goes everywhere you don't want it to go. Getting the water to go to the roots is very, very difficult. It's time consuming. It's, um, it's, it's not easy. So I really think that the ultimate solution is exactly what we're doing here, which is you're going to bring seeds in your pocket. You're going to convert regolith to soil in some fashion, which is not fully understood yet, or you're gonna do hydroponics, and you're gonna grow the things once you get there. So you'll be reliant on the machines for that up, up until those first harvests, just like we are in CMOC. That's probably the way it's gonna be done. Okay, so let's do, let's do one more. Thank you, yes. I'm gonna stop this simulation. Yep. And let's do a new simulation, and we're gonna load, um, go back to here, presets. And which one would you like to load next? Do you have a particular team you'd like for me to look at? I guess let's try the um, 
second one because it comes, uh, you know, first come, first served. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Now, I have not looked at this one yet, so we're going to be doing this together. So maybe I'll put you in charge of analyzing this one. So what's the first thing, Vero, you would like to do? What do you, what do you want to look at first? I'm putting you on the spot. Yes, this is new for me as well. So uh, that's a lot of people in the crew uh, compared to, I guess that was the requirement. Uh, however, I was expecting that, you know, three crews mean we can use one module example. So we could use three and see how it works. But let's, let's see, uh, this is really interesting. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and yes, we have nine inhabitants. Yeah. Okay. So what what we should we, let's um, what should we look at next? Should we look at uh, maybe the greenhouse configuration and see if sure. we brought? Yes. Okay. Please. Wow. So they packed it in. Amazing. <laughs> it looks way more car colorful. Um, <laughs> okay. So I think compared to the one before, uh, we don't. We see the free space. Is that the pink one? The bright pink? This, this one right here is the free oh, space. There's still 10 square meters. There's still 10 square got meters. It, got space. it. Yeah. So um, I guess, is that good? Yeah, it's, it's not really good or bad. We're just going to see what happens. So um, how about we whip through this thing really quick and, and see if the humans make it. Like that, that's yeah. the first thing, right? So let's go to right. the end and see if they make it. Do they make it? Yes, they make it. Okay, good. Wow, that's it. great. <laughs> okay, so what that tells us, what that tells us is that they brought enough power and enough battery. The reason that a humans, the humans would not make it is if there wasn't enough power, enough uh, power source, meaning solar panels, to recharge the batteries. If you don't have recharged batteries, your life support system fails and the humans die. So generally speaking, when you make it all the way to the end, it means A, you brought enough food, Yep. And you brought enough solar panels and batteries so that, that even if you didn't have any plants, you can make it all the way through. Got it. Right? So let's see how that, now let's see how the food does. The food is at 1200 starting. And oh, they're really on the boundary there. Look at that. They're down to zero. Okay. So uh -oh. I can tell you right now that we, they would have starved if this mission had gone just a little bit further. Uh oh. <laughs> I don't think they would have made it. But so the experiment that we uh, gave them was based on under four months. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the fact that we were projecting to build a permanent one uh, mm -hmm. using this model, would it be valid then? Like what nope. you just said? They would, not have, they would not have made it. They would not have made it. Yeah, so the, the, the buffer, um, the human buffer is uh, for food is 20 days. So you can see over here, it says without 20 days. Mm -hmm. So if they go 20 days from zero, mm -hmm. let's see, where do we hit zero for the first time? So 109 days, yep, 109 days. And we know the mission ends in 116. Mm -hmm. So at 109 days, we're only seven days away from mission termination. And so they're going to make it to the end. They're, they're, they're going to come back hungry. They're going to eat a lot of power bars when they get back on their orbiter. Their orbiter. <laughs> they are not going to be happy those la that last week. They're going to be eating very limited food. If this had gone on for another 20 days, they, they'd be very, very hungry, mm -hmm. depending upon when the harvest of the plants come in. How about water? Yep, good point. Let's look at water. Okay, so water storage. No, they're still okay for water. Okay. Harvest. I have a question about, uh, you know, the choices of these plants. How do you, of course, uh, you have that wonderful data from uh, NASA. Mm -hmm. And how do you see, uh, which is great for our food, but actually better for the balance of, you know, the, the CO2 and water and like how do we choose our food i mean which plants to grow yes yes we know that cabbage brings uh sequesters or, or 0.377 grams per square meter per hour strawberries 0.79 and wheat 2.5 look at the difference it's almost 10 times better at pulling in co2 okay so if we go back to this 
we look at uh, what were the two, so we're gonna compare cabbage to wheat. So here's cabbage and 0.377, and here's wheat, here's wheat just above it, 0.254. So all the data is right here. So you can see right here are the two data points that are shown right here and here. So if you had a choice, you would say, well, of course I'm gonna bring wheat, because A, we know that it's, it's more, it has more nutrients or more um, energy for us as humans than cabbage. But we also know cabbage is good for our digestive system, it's good roughage, it helps us helps clean this out, right? So it's a balance. You're not gonna to wanna to bring just wheat, or you're gonna have a lot of miserable people, especially if they're gluten intolerant, um, and you don't wanna bring just cabbage. But so let's look at the next set of vegetables, the next set of plants. Sweet potatoes are also 2.5. Very, very good at pulling in CO2. Green onions, eh, they're okay, but quite a bit lower. Uh, and tomato, or actually, they're, they're actually really bad at this, but we know we want green onions for cooking. Um, and then, and you can also eat almost the entire thing. Tomatoes, yeah, they're not so good either. So if you had a choice between wheat and sweet potatoes, which one would you choose to bring into your habitat? What do you think? Yeah. Well, sweet potato, yeah. as advised, uh, and wheat, and uh, balance with, I guess, uh, what was that earlier? Yeah, cabbage. cabbage. So if we look at it purely from a standpoint of bioregeneration and using the plants to pull down the CO2 and produce oxygen, we would say wheat and sweet potatoes are almost identical, right, in, right. Their, in their capabilities. However, as was demonstrated in the Biosphere 2. And, and Jane Pointner has a really good, um, has a really good book um, called The Human Experiment. And in her book, she talks about how they, they went through this exact same experiment. And it took them, as they say, it took them seven months to produce their first pizza because they had to plant the wheat, they had to grow the wheat, they had to harvest the wheat and process the wheat. Wheat is not easy, we can't digest it directly from the ground. But a sweet potato, you can pull out of the ground, wash it off and bite into it directly. Or if you cook it, it's even better. So if you have a choice, you're probably gonna choose sweet potatoes. And it turns out in the Biosphere 2 experiment, they ate so many sweet potatoes, they planted them everywhere, their skin turned orange. Because it gave them calories, it gave them a sugary substance, it was sweet, wow. and it pulled down the CO2. Um, and, and it was obviously very nutritious as well. So there's a lot to consider. Um, yeah. When, when you do this. And then the rest of it, once you have that basic CO2 sequestration done, the rest of it's going to be decisions based principally on nutrition. What do you need to stay healthy? Right. I saw and like pea, pepper, snap bean being. Yes. Yes. Like good good there. And, and if we look at, if we look at this, mm. if we look at this, you can just look at this table. You can say, well, yeah. 1.5, this right. is low, 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 low. Ooh, look at that one's good too. Which one is that by the way, I don't remember. Uh, that is dry beans. Dry beans is a legume. Legumes do really well. Uh, 1.5, 1.3, 1.6, what are those? Mm -hmm. That is peas, peppers, and snap beans. So snap beans are my favorite. Um, <laughs> and then at the bottom, we have two really good ones down here. What is that? That's sweet potatoes and white potatoes. Yeah, yeah, no wonder. Yeah. I was wondering yep. where, the Martian's idea came from. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But, but as you can see, th this is fun. I mean, this is just is fun, great. cool stuff. There's so many facts and, yeah. and, and so much to learn. And it really, I grew up on a farm in Iowa as, as a kid. My, my grandparents were farmers and we didn't think about farming like this. You know, mm -hmm. we thought of it from a very different point of view. But this brings me back to my roots and, and my heritage on, on a family farm, but from a completely different point of view. Of, of looking at it, not just in terms of crop rotation and seasonal fluctuations, and are we gonna get enough rain this year, or is the, mm. is the crop gonna be wiped out by, by insects? This mm. looks at it at a completely different point of view. Well, Kai, yeah. that was fascinating. I'm really excited, and I would go back to the team, and I'm sure they will learn a lot, and they will re-experiment this, and we're really supportive to what you're doing. I think it's really helpful. And uh, this is all we need. And if you need anything else from our, from us, just the uh, same here. We will okay. support you. Excellent. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure working with you. I look forward Thanks. to more. We'll have to do more of these sessions. And when we get a chance, let's do one live with some of your team members. Yes. Uh, so we get more interaction. And
They're so excited. And uh, every time I have their feedback, I will quote them and send it to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll work on editing this. Okay. I appreciate it. Bye. You're